so we're going to get started. Um, this uh, workshop is called How to Divest from Racism and Support Black Americans, Black and South Asian Solidarity. So one of the uh, very important things to understand is, first of all, if we're going to divest from racism uh, and, and prejudiceness and support Black Americans, we need to understand some basic definitions of what words mean. Because we, we, we're reading articles, we're reading blog posts, we're on social media, and we see all these different terms circulating all over the internet, but what do they mean? And everyone has a different understanding of it, so let's get into some of those definitions. So the first definition is prejudice. Uh, prejudice, a positive or negative attitude towards a group, a person or group, form without just grounds or sufficient knowledge and likely to be changed in spite of new evidence or contrary argument. Prejudice is an attitude. All social groups can, pro can possess them. They are often expressed through code words and symbolic issues rather than overtly offensive language. Uh, so uh, for example, um, you know, we, a lot, you know, many of us, uh, you know, have, have learned different ideals and different terms and language from our parents. Things that we grew growing up from, we've learned from our parents, our friends, our family. And so um, how can sometimes you, sometimes we may have a positive or negative attitude towards a certain person or group, but without really having an understanding of where it comes from. We kind of, maybe we heard it, uh, you know, from someone saying it, you know, a friend saying it, or we read it somewhere online. That's what prejudice is. The next word is discrimination, which means unequal treatment of people based on their membership in a group. In contrast to prejudiceness, discrimination is an actual behavior. So to discriminate uh, is to treat a person uh, not on the basis of, of their individual qualities, but on the basis of prejudgment about a group. So discrimination can manifest in laws or in practice without legal sanction, okay? Uh, so for example, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of these videos, these viral videos of Karens and Kevins, right, going viral of, uh, you know, white people, you know, calling the, calling the police on, uh, on black people and, 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 and also black and brown people, communities of color, um, for doing everyday regular things such as swimming, driving, um, you know, eating at a restaurant, um, you know, it could, you know, attending, attending a protest or, um, you know, at a park, right? We've seen these examples over and over and over again. Um, and so that is what it means to have unequal treatment against a certain uh, membership of group of people. The third term is oppression. The systemic exploitation of one social group by another for its own benefit. It involves institutional control, ideological domination, and the imposition of dominant groups culture on a marginalized group. It is pervasive, woven into social institutions, as well as embedded within individual uh, consciousness. It is restricting structural limits, significantly shape a person's life chances and sense of possibility in ways beyond the individual's control. It is hierarchical. The dominant or privileged groups benefit often in unconscious ways from the disempowerment of subordinated or targeted groups. So an example of oppression is or records and so there you know there has always been this large discussion in the United States around what it means um, for you know people who have served their time to come back out onto into society and and live everyday life like everyone else and so um, the abolishment of of, uh, of of criminal records for example of, of employee of, of um, um, institutions employers asking have you ever been to jail before? And having to check that box, that is a form of oppression because the employer can make the decision about whether or not they wanna hire someone regardless of the skill level that they have, right? Um, in, into being employed for that position. 
And there are many uh, employers who, who use that as a form of discrimination to oppress, continue to oppress a certain uh, individual, especially if they have a criminal background or criminal record. So in some states, in many states actually, there are many uh, organizers and activists on the ground who are trying to work to removing that barrier because that is a barrier uh, for people who are trying to come back out into society and do the right thing. The next term is privilege. We've all heard that term everywhere. Um, we, um, we, we know in, in, in some instances what it might mean. The definition that I have here for to you today is the benefits automatically received from being a member of the dominant group. Privilege includes not having to think about the implications of one's identity because of automatically fitting in a category that is the norm or the standard for society. The advantages created for members of the dominant group are often invisible or considered rights, available to everyone as opposed to privileges awarded to only some individuals and groups. So having access to land, having access to uh, you know, funds, um, you know, being able to get bank loans and you know, for your home or um, you know, are all privilege shows up in various forms. An example for me, I was give it, just to give a little bit even more context about, about privilege, is, is the fact that I have in my family, for example, I have had the opportunity of being able to attend college. I'm currently a grad student at American University in DC. And so, um, and have received scholarships and things like that. So that is, that is a privilege, um, that, a privilege that many of my ancestors, for example, did not have the opportunity to, to do, right? Is me being able to attend college. That's one example. Uh, the next term we have here is diversity. Now we see this term a lot. And the thing that I want to very specifically put, uh, point out is that diversity and anti-racism don't necessarily mean the same thing. They're very different terms. Diversity speaks to the statistical presence of an individuals of varying physical characteristics, cultures, or identities in a group. Diversity is silent on the subject of equity. I'll say that again. Diversity, diversity is silent on the subject of equity. In an anti-oppression context, therefore, the issue is not diversity, but rather equity in most cases. Often when people talk about diversity, they are thinking of only the non-dominant groups. Diversity requires a mix of people of different races, genders, sexual orientations, et cetera. Uh, so for, a, for example, um, when it comes to diversity, let's think about how many businesses there are that posted Black Lives Matter statements when all the protests had erupted. You know, they said that we support Black Americans, we stand with the protesters, Black Lives Matter. However, when you go and say there's an organization, let's say, let's take Starbucks, and you go to their website, and you click on the About section, or the Staff section, and you look at the people who make up the management of, the, or, of, that, or, of that entity, Oftentimes it's very white. Or they will have, um, or, you know, entities will have a, a black person or another person of color, black or brown person, that's one that sits on a board, you know, an organization for, for, for board member that has a list of board members, right? And, and a lot of these entities think that, well, I hired a person, a black or a person of color, so we're diverse when they have at least 12 members on the board and only one or two people are POC or black. That is how the term diversity can be exploited. What comes into equity, equity means, equity disrupts that, disrupts that narrative, that you only need two people on a board of 12 to be diversified. So equity requires there be a mix a mix of people of different races, genders, sexual orientations, et cetera. So now the definition of racism is the next word. What is racism? 
In the United States of America, racism refers to individual cultural, institutional, and systemic ways by which differential consequences are created for groups historically or currently defined as white being the advantage. And groups historically or currently defined as non-white non people of color. That includes African, Asian, Latinx, um, Native American, the time of oppression, people of color, non-whites. Uh, so regarding, um, you know, racism, you know, when we're applying for jobs, when we are applying for, um, for, for home ownership, when we're applying for that volunteer opportunity, and we get that one question that says, what, are, what is your race? Who do you identify as? And we have to pick and choose. Why is that necessary, right? It's there, it's there for a reason. And it's so normalized. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I chose it as an example, because a lot of people think that that's, norm that think that that's normal. It shouldn't matter what your race is. What matters is your credentials, what matters is your, uh, your background, your skill level, that's what matters, not your race on an application for a job. That should be entirely removed from the pro from that, those processes. The next term, cultural appropriation. The use of cultural symbols, such as dress, hairstyle, religious artifacts, ceremonies, by someone who is not a part of the culture from which the symbols came from. Cultural appropriation is usually considered to be a majority group, usually white people, M mimicking a minority cult culture for the jewels of its heritage for their own pleasure or benefit while the voices of their culture remain silent or silenced. An example of cultural appropriation, white women belly dancing. I know my head side. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, cultural appropriation. White people belly dancing in the United States and, 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 and across the world, right? Wearing the, the symbols, wearing the dress, wearing the hair, the hair pieces, um, and, and celebrating in, in a, a culture that does not come from them. Another example of cultural appropriation wearing photo models photographing in Native American attire for photo shoots, for runway shows, for magazine spreads, right? Not hiring an actual, an, an actual Native American person to represent that culture. That is cultural, cultural appropriation. Another example of cultural appropriation when it comes to black people is wearing uh, things like hoop earrings or um, listening to certain types of music, dressing, um, a, a, adapting black culture, our, our dress, our hair, uh, the, way, the way that we, um, you know, different terms that we, that we use amongst, amongst each other. That's all cultural appropriation, right? The uses of cult cultural symbols. The next word we're gonna go over is white supremacy. This is a hot button word because it is often association, associated with extreme groups of white people who openly express hatred for people of color. However, it is normalized, it is a normalized belief that white culture, attitudes, behavior, belief, standards, history and values is superior to all others. We may not say that we believe in this, but we often act on a belief when we expect all other groups to meet that standard. It is a term for the idea of white superiority and is a foundation of all racism in the United States. So for example, a term of, I can tell you within black communities, there, there's always this thing of, well, you talk white 
or you dress white or you, you know, talking white. Um, another is, um, you know, acting white, code switching in, in workplaces, right? Um, sometimes communities of color can be very prejudiced towards each other and feel that you should rise to the expectation of whiteness, that we should always strive to be exceptional when it comes to, to whiteness. That is white supremacy because I am not a white person, right? There is no way I'm going to be able to, and I shouldn't have to, be able to subscribe to white supremacy culture. So uh, another example is in the United States, a lot, of, a lot of Black people are fired from their jobs for wearing their natural hair, for wearing uh, braids or uh, dreads or, you know, afros or, you know, um, different things like that because it doesn't mix or doesn't blend in the same as this in this white supremacist culture. Um, and so white supremacy culture is very dangerous and it is, um, it is very insidious, um, especially in the corporate world, right? Um, the next word we're going to go over is equity. What does equity mean? I brought it up a little bit earlier the condition and process together that will be achieved if the identities assigned to historically oppressed groups no longer acted as the most powerful predictor of how one fares. The root causes of inequities, not just their manis manifestations, would be eliminated. This includes elimination of policies, practices, attitudes, and cultural messages that reinforce or, or fail to eliminate disproportional outcomes, economic, educational, health, criminal justice, et cetera, by a group identity. So an example of that would be the how, in terms of housing and, and, and economics in the United States. Black people do not have the same, the same levels of income per household as white people and other, other communities, um, especially other communities of color. So equity would mean that we all would be on the same on the same playing on the same playing field. Black people would not have to work work twice as hard. Other people of color would not have to work twice as hard to meet the same result. That's that is what white supremacy forces us to do. It forces us to compete against each other for opportunities. It should not be that way. We shouldn't have to live in a society where every person, no matter your, your, your class, your gender, your race, your sexual orientation, your religious beliefs, everybody should have an opportunity to provide a well-being for themselves and their families. And that is not the case currently in the United States, but that's where, that is what we are striving for. We are striving for a better world because we know a better world is possible. The last word is going to be anti-blackness. Anti-blackness is something that people of color uh, tend, can, um, you know, tend to participate in. The Council for Democratizing Education defines anti-blackness as being a two-part formation that both voids blackness of value while systemically marginalizing black people and their issues. The first form of anti-Blackness is overt racism. Beneath this anti-Black racism is the covert structural and systemic racism, which categorically predetermines the socioeconomic status of Blacks in this country. The structure is held in place by anti-Black policies, institutions, and ideologies. The second form of anti-Blackness is the unethical disregard for anti-Black institutions and, po and, and, and policies. This disregard is the product of class, race, and or gender privilege certain individuals experience due to anti-Black institutions and policies. This form of anti-Blackness is protected by the first form of overt racism. And um, this definition also um, came from the Movement for Black Lives, if you all are, are familiar with that, one of the organizations that has been very vocal about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and et cetera. So anti-Blackness, right? 
lots of times people of color can participate in anti-blackness where you think that um, a certain group of people, uh, for example, a question someone would ask is why would, uh, you know, why would people in a community uh, tear down their community? Why are they, why are they protesting? Why are they tearing, burn, why are they burning things? So, or, or, or believing that property matters over black lives, right? That's pretty much what that means. Um, the, 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 these entities, these businesses that, that own this land, that uh, the Walmarts and, um, you know, the Starbucks corporations, all these corporations who own these, who take up space in these Black communities, people don't own these businesses. And these businesses are not, they are, per, one might argue that they're providing jobs, right? But what are they, what, how much are people making, right? When you're, when it comes to talking about um, wage, the wage gap, how much are people actually making per hour at these businesses? Oftentimes places like Walmart will hire people and will have them do a ton of labor, Amazon being one of them, and pay them a wage that is not livable. So not only are you taking up space in those communities, right? And making them think that you're making some type of a difference uh, by providing jobs, but, you, but when it's time to stand up for black Americans, there's an issue with saying black lives matter. So do black lives actually matter? Or do you only care about black dollars, right? So uh, I think it was Starbucks, for example. Starbucks, you know, at some point told their employees that they couldn't wear Black Lives Matter, you know, shirts and hats and masks. When Starbucks has allowed their employees to wear LGBTQ merchandise at their establishments. That is anti-Blackness. Now, Starbucks came back around and said, whoa, wait a second. We didn't mean it. We stand for Black lives, right? They had to backtrack and had to put out a statement because there was so much backlash because of it. Now, I work in media and communications. I have no idea who thought that that was a good idea to do at a time like now. That was a bad, I, that was a bad public relations move on behalf of Starbucks. Um, and I think that Whole Foods actually had another incident with, with that as well, where they were, um, some, where they were you know, asking their employees to not wear uh, Black Lives Matter you know, merchandise and things like that, but allow LGBTQ uh, shirts and hats and all that kind of stuff. That is anti-Blackness. All right, so the second part of this, um, we're moving now moving to the second. The first was definitions. The second part is identifying racial inequities and disparities. So racism yields racial inequities and disparities in every sector of private and public life. That includes politics, healthcare, criminal justice, education, income employment, home ownership. Being anti-racist means, means learning about and identifying inequities and disparities that give in particular white people or any other racial group material advantages over people of color. So what I would like you all to do is think about um, in your communities where you live, if there have been examples of where you were able to identify a racial inequity and disparity. Um, it could be in, you know, whether it be in your, maybe, you know, where you go for worship, it could be in your own community, right? And, and, and again, I'm referring to material advantages. So access to resources, uh, access to funding, access to clean water, access to housing, right? Thinking about those privileges, going back to that word. Um, that we may that we may have over some over someone else, um, and also too thinking about when we see, are seeing all of these protests erupt over the country, 
really think about what types of communities are experiencing heavy policing. What kinds of communities, why are there so many cops policing one community, right, over, uh, over another? Um, and again, it goes back into, po in, in, into racial disparities in politics. When we think about, let's talk about the election. In the beginning of the election, we had a wide range of, of, of people who were of, of uh, candidates, presidential candidates, had a wide range. And who do we, and, and where are we, who do we end up with? After, after ripping apart every person of color that ran for president of this country, ripping them to shreds, judging them on their judging them on personal attributes that don't have anything to do with politics right all of these people all of the people these folks got pushed out of this election and we ended up with having in the united states we ended up having two white men who were, at the end of the day, were, you know, uh, campaigning against each other for one seat. So we ended right back down to square one. Right? That's an that is an idea, and that is 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 has been one of the greatest examples of uh, racial uh, inequities and disparities. Is the is the twenty twenty election going to go to two or number three is confronting and acknowledging racial racist and prejudiced ideas you've held you've held or continue to hold on to some of those examples can be black on black crime right when we hear of a you know when when a, you know a white person goes in and blows up a church we don't see reports and things circulating on white on white crime we just don't uh, the media is a very heavy influencer and when it comes to stereotypes. Calling black people drug dealers and crack addicts. As if that is the only thing that we, if that's all, if, first of all, as if black people, if, if black people are, are the only people that represent that, represents this type of stereotype, which is not true. Um, other examples of stereotypes is the wealth of uh, um, different food in terms of the foods that that uh, black Americans eat fried chicken and watermelon. That's a stereotype. Uh, welfare queen, uh, taking advantage of the, uh, of the welfare sy system. We hear our president consistently talk about cutting funding from social services, right? Um, and this is not to say that people, there are not people who don't take advantage of the system. Of course there are, but they're not all black is the point. And that's what anti-blackness is. Uh, believing that you can say the N-word if you are a white person and you're a person of color. That is a word that has, you know, historical complications. It's a word that many black people use. I don't work, I don't use the word, but there are other black people that do. That is a discussion for black people to have in terms of how to use that word. People should not be having conversations about what debates about non-black people should not be having conversations about using that word. You just shouldn't use it. <laughs> um, the angry black woman stereotype is another, uh, you know, stereotype. Black women who speak up, um, you know, about various issues are seen as angry. They're also um, black women also also deal with a level of um, intersectionality when it comes to sexism, right? Because I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm black, and I'm also a woman, so being labeled angry, um, blackface. And then also this idea in the medical system that black people can take more pain. That is a stereotype. So if you've ever seen articles, for example, circulating that talks about how there are lots of black women who are dying. Um, I think Brittany's audio might have cut out. We're just going to. Oh. oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, we're we are often told that we're either um, you know we're making making up the symptoms, 
or that we are hallucinating or that we are, you know, we're sent, we're sent home without, without pain medication. When we come forward about the different types of pains that we're having, there are lots of doctors who don't know how to, who don't understand how to identify what, um, what pain and what, um, what symptoms can look like on black skin. Um, I just read an article today about a young man um, who's in medical school in London who came up with a guide for doctors and nurses so that they can better identify how to um, look, how to, um, to look for symptoms for, for, for in, in black people versus white people. So the medical system is based off of, you know, what kind of skin condition that you, it might be a skin condition. It could be really any kind of illness you might have. And it's based off of white, the, it, it being adjacent to white people and white skin. So this young man had to create his own guide in school, while he's in school, so that these doctors and medical, these, all these medical, medical profession, professionals can learn how to diagnose black people properly. And this is 2020, right? That makes no sense. Number four, remembering that anti-racism needs to be intersectional. Um, so if you all are, are, are aware, um, Kimberly Crenshaw is the director of the African American Policy Forum in New York. She coined the term intersectionality more than 30 years ago. This is, um, the, I took this quote just to read to you, um, just, to, just so that I can give you an example of what it means, what it means today, especially to the founder. She's, the question is, you introduced intersectionality more than 30 years ago. How do you explain what it means today? Kimberly Crenshaw says, these days, I start with what it's not because there has been distortion. It's not identity politics on steroids. It is not a mechanism to turn white men into the new Paris. It is basically a lens, a prism for seeing the ways in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. We tend to talk about race inequality as separate from inequality based on gender, class, sexuality, or immigrant status. What is often missing is how some people are subject to all of these and the experience is, is, not just, it is not just the sum of its parts. So pretty much what this word means is that we have all types of different identities, in particular for black women, because when she created this term, this was specifically for black women. Um, but the, the goal overall point of, of it is that we have, when we talk about race inequality, um, we cannot talk about it inseparable of, of gender, class, sexuality, and immigrant status, et cetera, et cetera. And I would advise all of you that if you are seeing a conversation from maybe a group or organization that you follow, or maybe an activist or something that is talking about racism, and they don't mention intersectionality, that, is, that should be a red flag for you. Because race is not, as a, as a black woman, race is not my only struggle. It is also me being a woman and other identities that I have, okay? Number five, taking action. Um, how can you make a difference uh, or stand for something? I always encourage people to volunteer at organizations that you, that you think is doing a, great, uh, doing a good job, Movement for Black Lives, South Asians for, for, for Black Lives. Um, not without black women, that's my organization. Um, organizing black, there's tons of organizations that you can support. Uh, supporting black women who are doing the work. Oftentimes black, or, black women organizers don't get the same amount of media coverage as men, uh, black male, uh, you know, organizers and, uh, you know, and activists of color. Um, continuing to educate yourself, attending protests, Go to protests if you, if you, if it's, you know, given COVID-19, you know, have your boundaries. But if you like, if you want to go, go to protests and, and, and connect with the communities that are organizing those communities, those Black-led communities and organizations that are putting on those protests. And then also advocating for policies. Uh, public policy is my, is what I want to go into eventually. eventually. Um, and there are lots of policies that, um, uh, you know, that have come out of the, the um, you know, the George Floyd um, Justice for Policing Act was just introduced a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, by uh, Senator Kamala Harris and a number of other senators. Um, you know, pay attention to public policy that's coming out of, that's coming out of these, uh, these moments of unrest. Here are some book recommendations for you all. These are some of my favorites. There are tons out there, but these are some of my most favorite books that talk, um, that, can, that can give you more context on, on how to be anti-racist and, um, and how you can, you know, have black and create black and brown solidarity. Um, all four of these books I have in my collection, um, they are books that I read over and over again. Uh, black Feminist Thought, uh, the knowledge, um, consciousness, and the politics of empowerment by Patricia Hill Collins is about like a Bible to me. Um, How to Be Anti-Racist by uh, by Kendi. Um, this bridge called My Back. Black Brown Solidarity. Racial Politics in the New Gulf South. These are just a few. There's lots of them, but these are just uh, some of my favorites. All right, so now we're gonna to move to a short video that I'd like to show you all. Just give me one second uh, to grab that for you. Hi everyone, Shazadi here. Today I want to talk to you about something unrelated to nutrition, yet extremely important. It does not matter what your profession and background are, because what's happening in the world, particularly in neighboring America, is a collective issue we must tackle. I was only six when my family uprooted to the UK. The painted image of our impending move consisted of serenity, adventure and excitement. I was apprehensive, but very thrilled about my foreseeable European life. What I wasn't told was how different it'll be. When I started school, I was visibly different. My lunches consisted of chapatis and leftover curries. There was a stark difference in my family life in comparison to my friends. I would try and speak English, but with a different accent. My long curly hair would always be tied in a long plait. But most importantly, I looked uniquely different. However, this wasn't the first time I'd experienced feeling out of place. As a brown child, I'd faced my fair share of colorism many times. Unsurprisingly, this came from my own community. At five, I was encouraged not to play in the sun because it would ruin my light complexion. I didn't understand why it mattered, but I became hesitant to play in the sun. Children around me were repeatedly told not to drink chai because it contained skin darkening properties. However, adults would have it, a logic I never understood. And to this day, South Asian children are taught names of fairness creams before they are taught how to read. Many Bollywood celebrities are complicit in promoting whiteness in South Asians. What we Desis tend to forget is our own history and heritage. Let me tell you a little history lesson about the Siddhis, people of African descent living in present day India and Pakistan. They are mostly concentrated in Sindh and Balochistan in Pakistan, as well as Hyderabad, Karnataka and Gujarat in India. While many of them came to Hindustan as slaves, others came as sailors, soldiers, mercenaries, merchants, eunuchs, concubines, and pearl divers. Siddhi merchants were supposedly one of the first people to make Muslim contact with Hindustan in what is today's Gujarat. Later, the Umayyad Caliphate's expansion in 712 AD into Sindh by Muhammad bin Qasim brought in black soldiers to Sindh. This means that Siddhis have been present in South Asia for thousands of years and unfortunately are not represented in media, education, and popular culture at all. 
they are only footnotes in history books. And in Sindh and Balochistan, their communities continue to be ruled by poverty. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter as South Asians, it is important to recognize that injustices against Black people are a global phenomenon. When I watched that horrific video of George Floyd being mercilessly killed by a police officer, it made my stomach churn. The other thing that horrified me was the second police officer watching him suffer. An Asian man being as racist as his white counterpart. So we've got about 10 minutes left of the session and you've all been sending in some amazing questions. So we're gonna make sure everyone gets a copy of the link to that full video and we're gonna move into the Q&A portion now. So the first question that I have for you, Brittany, from some of our attendees is, what are some really good ways to encourage and introduce the idea of anti-racism to friends and family who aren't so open-minded about this topic? And how do you make people understand the importance of this? Could you add, can, could you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you ask that question one more time? You were, you were breaking up just a little bit. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some great ways to introduce and encourage the idea of anti-racism to friends and families who may not be as open to individual behavior changes or as open to hearing about the topic? And mm -hmm. how do you make people really understand the importance of this? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the you know, so the truth of the matter is this: is that um, doing anti-racism work is anti-racism work is very hard. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience that um, it's, it's been very hard for, for me to get my uh, certain family members and friends to accept certain ideals. So some tips I would, I would recommend is, um, you know, I, I, first I recommend just because you all know your family and friends, right? You know, you know how some people have different ways of taking in, inform taking in information, um, various types of, and, and there's various options for doing that. Um, you know, one example that I can give with, with, when, with my mother, um, when I was giving, because my mom, for example, she's always asked me, Brittany, why do you, ha why do you host these anti-racism trainings? And only, cause a lot of the times these trainings are for white people that I do anti-racism and, um, dismantling anti-racism and white supremacy. Normally I do a lot of trainings for white people. And so she was like, well, why, why are, um, black people of color not allowed in those workshops? And so I had to explain to her, you know, kind of the basics, right, of, of, um, of, of you know, Black people, people of color, we don't need to be taught, you know, we, we know what racism is, right, in this country, um, you know, whether we've experienced it before, we, knew, we, we realize it or not. Um, and so I've, I've had conversations with my, you know, for example, with my family about these, about these topics. Um, I would recommend, um, you know, maybe really having sitting down and, and, and having some serious conversations with your with your family and friends about what's happening, you know, maybe open a open up a discussion, you know, have you ever had a discussion at all about what's happening in the United States? Um, and really letting, you know, that that family member or that friend know that you are a person, you care about the world, you want to make a difference. And so a part of making that difference really is just, um, you know, bringing them into the fold. You know, um, I wouldn't, I, I, I would, a, a lot of times like coming off as defensive can really be off-putting. So I would also try to, um, to provide them resources. Um, there are tons of information on the internet, um, different articles that you can, can be sending to them. Maybe you can send them an article and then you can have, um, have some, have an afternoon to talk about it over lunch or something, um, or, you know, a book recommendation, right? Some of the books that I recommend in the PowerPoint recommend that they read some of those books or any other ones that, that you find. Yeah, I, that really touches on, I think, the Jane values of empathy, compassion, and honoring other viewpoints. So, you know, calling people mm -hmm. in, expose them to new view. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question that we had is, how do you differentiate between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation? Because mm -hmm. as South Asians, something that we see a lot is, you know, Western or American people really like to use henna and like yeah. participate in yoga. And there was a recent Lululemon case where they like named all of their clothing namaste. And it's just like very hard to under, like know when to 
draw the line. Right. Yeah. No, I think that it's, you know, so it's really, it, this, the answer to that question is going to be very different depending on the community that you ask. Um, for me, I would say that um, I, I think it's important if, if there's going to be, like say white, you know, people or whatever, if they want to, you know, they do the, the henna and all that kind of stuff. I think that they should talk about that. I think that they should say, they should give some type of an acknowledgement um, that, you know, that, that, you know, where the cult, where that, where that cultural um, activity or that, or the dress or headgear, where did it come from? My issue has always been people who wear these, wear, you know, culturally appropriate by wearing things, first of all, without permission, without, without contacting, you know, having no connection to that community whatsoever. I have a lot of white friends who are belly dancers. And when I ask them, you know, do you have any type of connection to, you know, any, any communities or, and they tell me no. So it's like, it's kind of, it's, it's like cultural appreciation is great when you have permission, when you have received a blessing, when you have contacted that community that was, that is directly impacted by that and, and people understanding what it actually means to, um, you know, wear a culture, you know, whether it's clothing or headdress or, you know, shoes or whatever it is, or any kind of activity, what it means when, when you place those things on your own body. It's just, it's good to be aware, just be self-aware, you know, um, because you, ne you just never know um, if you're going to be able to offend, offend someone. So make sure that you have those things checked. Make sure you are accountable to those communities that you are trying to show appreciation for. Yeah, and I think that really ties into like an absence of ego, which is also such an important value in Jainism. Um, so we have another question from Kushi Shah. So there's been so many protests, speeches, campaigns, and it seems like I see so many movements about ending racism, but why does it feel like it's growing and not ending? Mm, that's a good question. It's, it feels that, that it's growing. You, you know, um, racism is not new in the United States it's being filmed now, right? So racism is being filmed. And so the reason why it feels like nothing is changing is because the fact of the matter is that racism is going to exist for a long time. It's gonna be here when, we're, when we are gone. What I try to tell uh, people is to find your lane. There are many roles that you can play within the movement we are people who know we have empathy, we have compassion, we know how to identify, we care about people that we don't, I don't need to know people personally to care about their rights, right? I feel like we are a group of people here that, you know, especially based off of your principles, right? Um, it's not, it's, it's really about what you can contribute so that at the end, you can be able to say, I helped make a difference. Right, because it's gonna. A lot of these issues are gonna be happening for a very, very long time, um, and um, I think that in many ways we have succeed. We have gotten a lot of wins. We we've, we've made a difference in a lot of ways. Um, in other ways, we haven't. And so that's why um, you know this conference in particular. I heard that the, this was the first time that this was a discussion of topic for this conference. That's making a difference, right? Start start giving yourself credit for. The, the things that you are doing to contribute to the movement because it matters. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. Um, so thank you for that question, Kushi. And then I really loved that you spoke so much about intersectionality and the importance of that. And I think um, for me personally, I've seen so much about that, especially with violence against black trans women. Um, yeah. So why is it so important for black women to be leading this movement? Yeah. It's very important for Black women to be leading this movement because Black women are, again, I mentioned a little bit earlier that Black women, we're not only dealing with issues around race, we're also dealing with issues around gender, our sexual identities, and things, and, and things of that nature. We live in a society um, that is very, um, you know, when we think about politics and we think about all these issues that are very dominated by men. And
Okay, I think her audio cut out. We'll just give her a little bit to maybe come back in. Um, but keep sending in some more questions. We've got some more time. Well, the, oh, sorry, the Me Too movement, for example. Um, you know, there when you, when it comes to anti-racism, there is no one lane. There's multiple lanes that we have to we have to address when it comes to being anti-racist. And so, black women uh, can uh, have been leading on that front. Um, and that's why it's so important to support us. Amazing. Um, so one more question that we got is, how can I best practice effective allyship without overshadowing Black voices? Mm, that's a really, really good question. Um, so being an ally pretty much is, I think it's a lot more simpler than people think. It's really, you know, asking what resources do you need? Um, is there anything I can help with? Um, how can I, how can I, how can I, how can I help be a part of this movement while uplifting your voice? Right? Just asking, just asking, you know, really it's, that's really all it takes. And we, you have all kinds of organizers from that live in, uh, black organizers who live in, in all parts of, um, I'm sure you all are coming from all parts of, like of the country, um, connecting with those, those organizations in your communities. There is a black led something in your community somewhere that you don't know about. So find out who they are and, and just simply say, I am over it. Black lives matter, all power to the people. How can I help make a difference? And they will tell you exactly what you need to do in those specific communities to help. It all looks different depending on where you live. So just ask. Okay, so we've got one last question. Um, okay. In work culture or in like organizational culture, what is the most appropriate way to address white supremacy? Mm. These are good questions. <laughs> um, it's now that's a difficult one because it really just um, depending on where 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 this is. Um, I think that really speaking up about the trend, this you know this toxic trend that you see happening if you see if you see black people being silenced at work or at school your place of worship or wherever you're going speak up black people cannot be the only we cannot be the only people addressing racism and racism we can't do it alone we need we need your help so if you see it and if it looks off to you be a bystander be inter, intervene and and speak up and say no this is wrong um that is really the best way we we oftentimes do not get a lot of, a lot of support with that a lot of people are very hesitant and resistant to towards that if you see something wrong say something um that that is that is really in in, in any various space that's that is really how you can help Amazing. So we're nearing the end of the session. Um, and before we say bye to Brittany, we just want to point to lots of amazing programming capping throughout the rest of the day. So we hope you'll join us at 2.15 p.m. EST for Malik Pancholi's keynote conversation. And then later in the evening for other JNF sessions, particularly our faith-based allyship panel and Barag Mitha and Vape of Jane. So Brittany, if you have any last words, we know a lot of people really want the resources and the book recommendations. Um, I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, I wanna thank all of you so, so much for joining me for this conversation. Um, I, it's such a privilege to be able to speak to you all. Um, I will definitely make sure that you receive the power, the, you know, the presentation so that you can get those book recommendations in case you didn't get them and the other resources. If you want to learn more about my work and if you wanna connect with me, uh, my web, please go to my website. It is www.brittany, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y, T, Oliver, O-L-I-V-E-R dot com. Please add me on social media. Reach out to me. I'm happy. I also do trainings. If there's someone, or an organization, or if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching around this, I'm happy to help be a resource in, in, in any way. And I really appreciate it. It's such a privilege to talk to you all. <laughs>